Hello, and welcome to the program module entitled Cultivating Vision and Change. You may know that the Orthodox Christian Leadership Initiative exists to nurture and empower Orthodox Christian servant leadership. And currently, OCLI has four modules in this program, Cultivating Vision and Change, which we will address today, Effective Parish Leadership Teams, Inspiring Generosity of Stewards, and finance planning and management. We begin our seminar today by asking the question, why cultivate? Cultivate is defined as the following, to foster the growth of, to improve by labor, care, or study. The word cultivate implies taking good care of something else, very often something else entrusted to us. And very often that word is used to describe what we do to a living organism. In this case, the living organism is the church. As we know in orthodoxy, the church is more of an organism than an organization. And just like any gardener knows, there are certain diseases and pests that can impede the growth of one's plants. The same is true with respect to the healthy growth of a parish. And now I will turn to some of those leadership challenges in our parishes. Low volunteer engagement, competing agendas and turf wars, resistance to change, egos and popularity contests, slow and sloppy decision-making, and donor apathy. Now today, we're going to give you some of the principles, disciplines, and tools of good leadership within the Orthodox context. Principles, you may know our fundamental laws, beliefs, or perspectives governing leadership conduct. Disciplines are patterns of behavior, good habits, we might say. Practices of facilitating excellence in leadership. And tools are the devices or methodologies used in the performance of leadership tasks. We're going to look at those more deeply. And you notice from this diagram, that the principles form the foundation, and then we go to the disciplines, which are again the healthy habits, and the tools that will be useful towards cultivating vision and change in parishes. Now it's important to notice that leadership is different in various contexts. For example, leadership on a battlefield will be quite different in many ways than leadership as a teacher in a kindergarten class. And leadership models that are out there now, even models that call themselves servant leadership models, are different in many ways than what we will be talking about. Here you see a slide that shows conventional leadership models. Conventional leadership model, models, many of them anyway, tend to start with one's will. It could be your passion or your love for a particular thing or organization. And then your own service and sacrifice going out to your authority and influence, and then the exercise of your leadership. What's unique about this particular approach is that it starts with an individual, their own feelings, their own self. They're also uh, assessing themselves, and the so-called success criteria are predetermined. They have, in other words, in mind, what they're going to do that will lead them to consider themselves to be successful, and then status and authority is earned accordingly. What's different about the Orthodox vision is that they start with the person of Jesus Christ. Vision in church leadership is about Jesus' ministry. It is his ministry. It is not our ministry. We are invited to share in his ministry. As the Lord says to his disciples, as is recorded in John 15, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. We also know the words of the beautiful prayer that the priest prays prior to the great entrance. For you, Christ our God, are the offerer and the offered, the one who receives and is distributed. In the Latin, we speak of Christ as the causa efficiens principalis. 
the efficient cause of ministry. Servant leaders are the causa instrumentalis. In other words, the instruments in Christ's hands. As St. Paul says, this is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. And the Orthodox Christian Study Bible states, Christ is both the source and the goal of ministry. Looking at this model then, this forms the base of our pyramid in Christ-centered Thulos leadership. Him, Holy Scripture, Orthodox theology. And then we move on to the work of the body of Christ, the church, a sense of obligation or duty to do Christ's work as the church that is also, of course, motivated ultimately by love. And then it leads us to serve in the way that we make the best use of our gifts and talents to serve God and others. So these are important bedrock principles we must have as leaders in Orthodox parishes. And so now we move on to more of the vision piece. What is our so-called highest why? We must ask ourselves, why are we doing what we are doing? What is our raison d'etre? I've asked the question before to some of the parishes that I have served. If our parish were to go away tomorrow, what would the people around us miss the most about us? Sadly, very often people answer that question by saying the Greek festival. That was what we were best known for. But we know as Orthodox Christians that we are called to something much more important than something of that nature. But what is our highest why? If we're struggling with that question, if the leaders in our parish don't quite know how to answer that question, don't worry, at least for now. <laughs> You're not alone. Many parish leaders don't really know the ultimate reason for their parish's existence. But you're not alone because even in the first century church, this was the case among the leaders. And did you know that there's actually a biblical reference of the very first parish assembly? Yes, it's in the book of Acts chapter 19. And it demonstrates how they struggle with their why. And I quote, the assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people did not even know why they were there. This is a common problem. But as we seek to cultivate vision, we must know our why. In his best-selling book, Start With Why, Simon Sinek gives us this very simple diagram. He also has a very popular TED Talk with over 28 million views on the same subject. So let's look at this diagram now. He says that many less successful organizations or businesses uh, start with the what and they move inward to the how or the why, if they even get to that. And he says that the problem with this is that unsuccessful businesses do not really inspire Successful businesses and organizations, on the other hand, always communicate their why first. They start with why. Why we do what we're doing. And this creates enthusiasm among their high-ranking employees and all of their employees and ultimately their customers. We could say our volunteers and our members become very enthusiastic because they know why they're doing what they're doing. And it's more inspiring for anyone who comes to that particular business or organization. It reminds me of a story of a pilgrim in 16th century Italy who was walking through a village and saw all kinds of people working. And as he came upon the first group of people working, he asked them, what are you doing? And as they were stirring something, they said, we are mixing concrete. And he moves on and goes to a second group of people and asks them, what are you doing? And they said, oh, well, we are putting together these poles and constructing scaffolding. And then finally he goes 
to another group of people and he sees a man carrying a brick, a brick in his hand. And he asked him, and what are you doing? And he said, I am building a glorious cathedral to do God's miraculous work on earth here in our village. Now, I asked you, which group of people would be more inspiring for you to come across in that village? So what is our highest why? Our common highest why as Orthodox Christians? Well, we could say a few things, but if we had to come up with just one word, our highest why, our raison d'etre, is salvation. St. Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith. So if the highest why is salvation, then how do we foster change? Isn't it interesting that the first word that came out of Christ's mouth when he began his earthly ministry was the word change? Now you might be saying, wait a minute, didn't he say repent? Actually, in the original language of the Bible, the Greek in this case, he said metanoite, which means change. It means change your noose. The noose in Orthodox understanding, is the center of one's being, the intersection of the mind, the heart, and the soul. And so Christ's first word that he spoke, again, during his earthly ministry, was change your mind, change your heart, change your soul. That's where we begin the concept of cultivating change. When I began seminary, I was very idealistic, and quite naive, and I thought that I could change the world. And as time went by as a seminarian, and I, let's put it this way, realized my own limitations, I thought, well, maybe I won't be able to change the world, but maybe I can change the church. And as time went on at seminary, towards the end of my seminary career, I thought, well, Maybe I won't be able to, to change the church, but when I become ordained, I'll be able to change my parish. And then <laughs> when I was assigned to my first parish, it didn't take me too long to realize that even that concept was extremely ambitious, perhaps even audacious. And I thought, you know, I'm having a hard enough time changing myself for the better. How is it that I'm going to even change I perish. And the point in all of that is that we must start with ourselves. There's that saying that everybody seems to say nowadays, become the kind of change you wish to see in the world. Well, let's take a look at what St. Gregory, the theologian, said to root us in that very concept as Orthodox Christians before we look at some other tools. Quote, a person must first be cleansed before cleansing others. First become wise to make others wise. Become light, and then give light. Draw near to God, and so bring others near. Be holy, then hallow others. That's coming from a saint. And I hope that we will realize that if we, if we expect to cultivate change in church or in our parish, that God is the ultimate change agent. If we hope to foster any change on our own, we have to first change through our own repentance. True change is not possible without God leading the way. So hopefully that's firm in our minds, in our hearts, as we look at the other tools that we're about to consider. And the tools I would like to share with you today come from three primary sources. Peter Block, who wrote the book, Community, the Structure of Belonging, Jim Collins, who wrote the book, Good to Great, and the companion book that we'll talk about, Good to Great and the Social Sector. And finally, I'm going to share some things with you about zero-based budgeting, which come from the Lilly School of Philanthropy's course entitled Nonprofit Leadership in the 21st Century. One of the things that Block says, and just, I think, very insightful, is you can't change people, but you can change the narrative, very important. Again, we have a hard enough time changing ourselves, much less another person. But we can change the narrative. 
as leaders of an organization. And I love this quote, you can't herd cats, but you can tilt the floor. What else does Block offer that I think is applicable in this situation? He says that the narratives, the conversations of stuck communities have certain principles or characteristics, as do the narratives of growing communities. Let's take a look at those now. A stuck community talks quite a bit about the past. They talk about fears and problems. They talk about scarcity of resources, not abundance. They talk about the institution and the rules of the institution and the oversight of the institution. And they seem to talk quite a bit in ways that blame others for their problems or difficulties. Growing communities, on the other hand, talk about the present and the future. They talk about possibilities. They talk about the gifts and talents of their team and of their members. They focus on relationships and how they can develop their relationships and become closer to God and others. They have what's called a chosen accountability. They agree to be accountable for their specific job within the body of the church. And along those lines, they take ownership for what goes right and wrong within the church humbly, and they commit themselves to following Christ and to serving him in the parish. A few other observations from Block. The future is created one room at a time, one gathering at a time. Think about our Lord in all the different places that he went, all the different miracles that he performed, all of the different, different lessons that he taught. In each of those contexts, he was fully present. He must have known that the people around him that were willing to buy in to his teachings and willing to commit themselves to him would indeed be inspired and changed by his life and ministry. And that's key because authentic community and change requires free will commitment. You see the picture there with the bride to be dragging the groom to be to the altar. That's not authentic community. Authentic community involves free choice. We invite, we do not coerce. And so we foster change by changing the narrative, by changing the conversation. And we do this more so by asking questions than making statements. Locke says we should ask powerful, honest, forward-looking, and constructive questions questions. For example, next time you're in a discussion where you're blaming things or talking about scarcity of resources or blaming other people or whatever the case may be, focusing on the past, try this question. Yes, but what do we want to build together? Simple, forward-looking, constructive. And then if people begin to buy into that question and begin to answer it constructively, then try asking this question. Now, what are each of you prepared to help make that happen? Prepared to give, rather, to help make that happen. And then finally, to what extent will we commit to creating a future that is distinct from the past? Okay, Cultivating Change continues now. We talk about principles that we take from Jim Collins' book, Good to Great and the Social Sector. He says that business principles cannot be applied to the social sector without modifications. He says that both share issues about moving from good to great, but the concept of greatness, and this is important, may be different in the social sector. In the social sector, leaders must go beyond simple business metrics to determine greatness. Leadership in a social sector is in a diffuse power structure. And it involves, among other things, getting the right people on the bus. And that's a metaphor that we'll talk about in a little bit. But within social sector constraints, 
So for example, businesses obviously hire people, hire their teams, fire their teams. In the social sector, we are heavily reliant on volunteers. And so there's a different dynamic there, obviously. A few other points. Social sector leaders are not less decisive than business leaders. They work within a more complex decision-making structure. They are accountable to more people. Uh, their approach has to be more legislative than, and execu than executive, rather. They have to persuade. They have to influence people. They can't just order people around, right? Leaders have to do what is right for the organization. And this is a tough one. Not just try to be nice to preserve the status quo. I think that very often can be a hang up for a lot of nonprofits heavily reliant on volunteers and many of our churches. It's a, it's a different thing to be good than to be nice. Obviously it would be great to be both, but sometimes we have to be good in a way that leads us to make decisions that may not be liked by other people. Uh, leadership is not just exercising power, as I mentioned a moment ago. A moment ago leaders must gain buy-in and in order to uh, gain support. Some other things along these lines from Jim Collins, leaders in the social sector should concentrate on outputs, not just inputs. And they can use outputs that defy measurement. Businesses make widgets a lot of times where they have a very straightforward service that they offer. But the measurement might be more qualitative than quantitative. So for example, our goal is to have an extremely kind and loving community. There could be also quantitative measurements taken, such as we want to double the number of pledging households in five years. The important thing though, is to make sure that whatever measurements you use are measurements that describe what greatness will look like for your parish. Let's move on to a couple more principles that come from Collins. One key concept is that of the hedgehog. Now you might be wondering why hedgehog? There's an ancient Greek proverb that says that the fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one thing that is big. So what Collins did was he examined the most successful businesses and organizations that went from good to great and he said that they knew their hedgehog very well. And what is a hedgehog? It's the confluence of these three things. Number one, what you're deeply passionate about. Number two, what you're best at in the world. And number three, what drives your economic engine. But a hedgehog alone is not enough. Going from good to great comes about by a series of good decisions made consistently with a hedgehog concept in mind, supremely well executed, accumulating one upon another over a long period of time. So this is not something that happens overnight. Once the hedgehog is identified in your parish, a series of good decisions must take place over and over again, and they accumulate one so-called win after another. Lastly, with respect to Collins, he gives us this wonderful analogy of the bus. Quite simply, he says that once you have your hedgehog, you must work very hard to get the right people on the bus, the wrong people off the bus, and the right people in the right seats. Now, again, this is challenging, having many volunteers within our parish. But the leadership team needs to consist of the right people. Sometimes we have people that are part of the leadership team in one role or another who actually get in the way of the clear and compelling mission of the church. This is unfortunate and it needs to be addressed and it's very challenging. And yet this is part of adhering to the hedgehog of the community and moving from good to great within the community. And finally, he says that we need to get the right people in the right seats on the bus. And when I hear this, I think of St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians chapter 12 that talks about one body, but a variety of gifts. 
We have to have the right people with the right talents in the right roles. With this in mind, as we wrap things up, we must resist the temptation to put the urgent above the necessary. So many times we have so many things coming at us. And uh, as one of my priest friends said to me, and I got a chuckle out of it, when I was a young priest and I was struggling because I felt like a one-armed plate spinner going around plating, spinning all these plates to try to keep everything going within the parish. And I felt like I was the proverbial jack of all trades, but master of none. And in speaking with this senior priest, he said to me, Jim, you better be very careful because People will shoot on you all the time. And he said, when I say that, people will say, we need to do this, or we need to do that. And more often than not, when they say we, what they're really saying is you as the priest need to do this, or you need to do that, or you as the parish council president need to do this, or need to do that. And there's a risk in that. Because if we're doing so many things, we may not be able to do a few things very, very well. And that's why I know show this slide to you that is the icon of Martha and Mary. We know the saying, a woman named Martha received Christ into her house. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching, but Martha was distracted with much serving and she essentially scolds Christ or asks him to scold her sister to help her serve the meal. But Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. One thing is needful. Mary made the better choice, right? So we have to learn to attend to the necessary above the urgent. Finally, I draw your attention on this slide to the book entitled Saying No to Say Yes, Everyday Boundaries and Pastoral Excellence by Olson and DeVore. And this book was written by faculty who are part of the Danielson Institute at Boston University who studied problems among clergy and parishes. And they realized that very often when clergy in particular tried to do too much and tried to essentially rescue or save failing parishes or challenged parishes, that what ended up happening is they burnt out or they ended up committing some kind of scandal uh, because they were too diffuse in their leadership. And that if they only learned to say no to the peripheral things, to the urgent things, and focus on the things that are necessary, not only will they be more healthy, but their community will be more healthy and successful. And that gets back to that hedgehog principle as well. Finally, I'd like to offer you a diagram that I think ties these things together. I mentioned it earlier. I learned this from the Lilly School of Philanthropy. And I think it uh, kind of ties all of these principles and disciplines and tools together. Because part of the hedgehog, as you saw from the illustration, involves your economic engine. What drives your institution or your organization more than anything else? So let's take a look at that slide now. I say start with who? Simon Sinek says start with why. Uh, we as Orthodox Christians would say, start with who? That person is Christ. And then we move on to our why, our clear and compelling mission. After that, we should ask ourselves, what are our goals in order to advance our mission? Some parishes have a strategic plan. I advise that as well. Maybe it's a three, five, 10, 20 year strategic plan that are designed to help the parish foster their goals over those periods. Then, of course, there are the parish programs. These are something that advance, of course, the goals and the mission. Finally, those, those programs, I shouldn't say finally, next, those programs also have initiatives. And those initiatives and programs cost money. So that box is the box related to expenses, Finally, and this is the piece that unfortunately many parish leaders miss, evaluation and assessment. How well did our programs do? How can we help these programs to be more successful in advancing the goals of the parish, which in turn advance the mission of the parish? And the difficult part is the annual budgeting process 
goes back to zero after every year. So the evaluation of the budget is connected to, not divorced from, but connected to the effectiveness of the programs within the church. And those programs, again, are designed to advance the goals and the mission of the church. So the programs that are not successful and not salvageable could be discontinued. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's saying no to say yes. And then the money could be reallocated to the programs that are most effective at advancing the goals of your parish ministry team. Thank you very much for your attention during this seminar. It is my sincere and heartfelt prayer that this material will be useful to you and your fellow parish leaders as you seek to serve Christ and his holy church in all that you think, say, and do, and that you're able to build up the body of Christ, which is the church, through your service. God bless you.